Hey film fans, let me ask you a simple question. What is Hollywood? Simple, right? It's a place in California, a district of Los Angeles. It's the place that historically was the locus of the American film industry. And back in the teens and especially in the 20s and into the 30s, the big movie studios established their home bases, or most of them anyway, in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. Uh, today they've spread out a bit. I believe the only major studio that still has its uh, home lot in Hollywood is Paramount. There's also the Gower Studios, which were long associated with Columbia. I think they're independent now, but they still work with Columbia and other studios to do television production and films and so on. But most of the studios have actually moved outside of Hollywood to uh, the Valley or Century City or other places like that. Um, which leads to kind of a second definition of Hollywood, which is the way that it acts as a metonym for the American film industry. If you scratch your brain and think back to English class, a metonym is a kind of metaphor where one thing represents something bigger that is closely associated with it. And we use this all the time. So when we want to talk about the financial industry in America, for example, uh, we say Wall Street. Now, Wall Street's a real place. You can go, you can walk there. It's in Lower Manhattan. You can look at the bull statue and so on. But also Wall Street, when we say Wall on Wall Street today, we don't mean actually on Wall Street, although some of the events might have occurred there. We mean in the American financial industry. When we say the Oval Office said, <laughs> wah, 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 or the White House said, wah, 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 right? We're not talking about the building or the room. We're talking about the seat of the executive branch of the federal government of the United States. And we might say the same thing for 10 Downing Street, or sometimes they even say number 10, uh, and so on. And we, we do this a lot. And we do it with Hollywood. So Hollywood is representative of the American film industry as a whole, regardless of where the studios are set or where the film was made. It might have been filmed in a studio in Budapest, but it's still a Hollywood movie. And that sort of metonym, a Hollywood movie, carries meanings with it and associations, right? It's going to have a pretty clear narrative. It's going to have a relatable protagonist, hero or heroine. There are going to be recognizable conflicts that uh, lead to a climax. And in the end, most of the time, we're going to get a Hollywood ending, which is when the hero wins the movie or the couple comes together and we end with a kiss or the sunset or whatever it is. Those have become cliches, but we still get the Hollywood ending most of the time. Um, and this can, this can apply to films that aren't even from the big studios. So sometimes we can talk about Hollywood films coming out of kind of minor studios or indie studios and so on. Like Miramax films in the 90s were still Hollywood films. A24 films are still Hollywood films. Um, and then related to that and getting into what I want to talk about is Hollywood as a sort of deeper or more existential kind of metaphor for hope and desire for fame, for wealth, for the riches associated with success in the American film industry. Hollywood is the dream factory. And in one sense, that means the way that it puts all of our dreams up on the screen for us to go and empathize with and relate to and get the feels from. But it's also the dream factory for the people who go there en masse and who have been going there en masse for over a century to try to make it. But the flip side of that and the reality for most of those people is that it's also the city of broken dreams because most people don't make it in Hollywood and Hollywood is often metaphorized as a city that will eat you up and spit you out. And that's true even for the famous, you know, and that's where we get this uh, famous line, you'll never have lunch in this town again because you have blown it. This city's going to destroy you. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because Hollywood loves to make movies about itself. Hollywood loves to be its own subject. That's not 
you know, a surprise. Writers like to write books about themselves. Uh, filmmakers within Hollywood and outside of it like to make films about themselves. Francois Truffaut working in the French New Waves, making films about himself, and so on. Um, Hollywood as an industry likes to make films about itself. And it, while it does that in many ways, there's two kind of typical ways it does that. One is to sort of show the dream factory, to show the success, the possibility of success, to show the happiness, right? Hooray for Hollywood. And one of its greatest outputs ever in that way is singing in the rain, for example. And then the flip side of that is that it likes to make the films about the broken dreams, the films about the never made it's, the also rans, or the almost made it's who failed, the city that eats you up and spits you out. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next few episodes of What Makes This Film Great. I had a survey on the community page, and this won the poll, and so. We're going to talk about Hollywood films that represent Hollywood as the city of broken dreams. Hollywood films that represent it as a city that eats you up and spits you out. Um, even sometimes when you think you've made it. Hollywood as a place of cynicism and despair. Um, this came out of my thinking when I was doing the scuzzy noir, the scuzzy 70s crime films, and particularly uh, Night Moves, which is a film that's not really about Hollywood, but is about Hollywood in a lot of ways. And so it came to me when I was doing that, that I should do a film, uh, a series about, uh, films about the scuzzy side, the seamy side, the, the darker side of Hollywood. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to kick it off with a film that I've loved for a long time, based on a book that I've loved even longer. And that's the 1975 film, The Day of the Locust. The subject of this episode of what makes this film great. Before we get started, two things. First of all, as I've mentioned in some previous videos, uh, I have a fairly new youngish puppy. He just turned eight months the other day, and uh, he's in a particularly rambunctious mood today. So I'll try to sort of space out my talking so that it doesn't overlap with his barks. But you might have already heard him in the background, and you might hear him throughout this video. Apologies for puppy barking, but uh, puppies go and bark, right? Secondly, I'd just like to thank my follower Eric Van Zanten for suggesting this film. He mentioned having seen recently a 35mm cut of Day of the Locust and that I should do an episode on it. And I was like, yeah, of course, I've got to do an episode on that. And that was just, I think that was last spring, and I was thinking about when am I going to do Day of the Locust, and then I did Night Moves, and this whole idea of scuzzy Hollywood came together. So thanks, Eric, for the suggestion. Um, let's get to the movie. The Day of the Locust is a 1975 Paramount film directed by John Schlesinger. And Schlesinger is a British director who had a fantastic career starting in the 60s up into the very tail end of the 1990s. So a 30-year career. Um, he directed Darling in the 60s, which kind of put the actor Julie Christie on the map. Of course, Midnight Cowboy, which is probably... I don't know if it's his best known film, but his most celebrated film, maybe. It's the film for which he won an Academy Award for Director. Uh, the Day of the Locust, of course. Marathon Man, that fantastic sort of thriller, almost horror film, which we'll come back to, with uh, Laurence Olivier and Dustin Hoffman. The Falcon and the Snowman, which uh, I got a 10 year old son I've mentioned a few times, and so we watch Marvel stuff, of course. And we were watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier, last summer or whenever that came out, and I just kept calling it Falcon and the Snowman. Uh, this was a big film when I was a young teen, and um, it's a spy movie. It's really great. It's got Timothy Hutton and Sean Penn, I want to say. Ooh, I should have looked that up, but I think so. And um, it became a running joke, because sometimes I would do it on purpose. I'd be watching Snowman tonight, and he'd be like, Daddy! You know, kids are like very sort of... Mm, precise about getting things right, you know? It's the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Oh yeah, the Falcon and the Snow... I mean, anyway, jokes aside, that's a John Schlesinger film. Um, this lovely kind of early 90s uh, 
twisted thriller Pacific Heights with Michael Keaton and Melanie Griffith and Matthew Modine. Cold Comfort Farm. Lovely, like, sort of English costume drama, super funny with Kate Beckinsale and a bunch of those British costume actors. So really a fantastic career he had. And Day of the Locust comes kind of smack dab in the middle. And it's a film that everybody involved thought would do better than it did. But it's a weird film and it's based on a weird source. And Schlesinger and his colleagues made it in a weird way. So yes, it was the 70s and yes, people were open to um, the darkness and cynicism that are present in this film, but also it's, it, it's pacing the way it straddles generic lines. It's unsympathetic, almost in some ways invisible protagonist, especially when compared to the novel. Um, I'll make it, it's a hard film to pin down, um, but it's, that makes it fascinating to watch. The cinematography is by the fantastic Conrad Hall, one of the great American cinematographers, sort of the first developer in a Hollywood film of the use of the lens flare. I talked about that in a video before. Editing, which is really good and really an important part of this film by Jim Clark. Costumes by the wonderful Anne Roth. Music by John Barry. I mean, it's an all-star group of behind the camera talent and in front of the camera talent. There's these amazing stars. Karen Black, one of the big actors of the 70s, who's in so many fantastic films, plays Faye. Donald Sutherland plays Homer Simpson and William Atherton, who never really became like a big leading man but who plays a lot of wonderful, sort of smarmy second characters, is the protagonist, Todd. And then you just get a host of wonderful character actors, former famous stars who are getting older, who put in great performances. Burgess Meredith, who probably most people these days still know as Mickey from the Rocky films. He's not on screen a lot, but his performance is wonderful and full of like anger and disappointment and pathos, really good. The little person, Billy Barty, plays Abe, who's a great character in the book. I think he gets a little bit short shrift in the film, but still played magnificently and nasty character. Everybody's <laughs> pretty much a nasty character uh, in the film. Richard Dysart shows up in a, in a role that's retooled quite a bit from the book. Um, Geraldine Page shows up in one important scene as, as a sort of holy roller. Uh, evangelical pastor and Jackie Earl Hurley who probably most of you know I don't know as Rorschach from the uh, the Watchmen movie but who's in one of my favorite 70s films as a child actor the Bad News Bears the year before plays this very important annoying character adore John Hillerman has a small role Paul Jabara a great songwriter mostly that some of you who are into musical theater and and sort of 70s songwriting will know has this one really excellent role as the cross-dressing trans cabaret performer and in a host of other kind of 70s era you know I talk a lot about these 70s faces they show up throughout the film so behind the camera in front of the camera this is a host of incredible talent to tell this story about Hollywood in the 1930s. And before the Day of the Locust, as I've said, is about Todd, an Ivy League University graduate, an art student who's come to Hollywood to kind of try to make it as an art designer, art director for Hollywood Pictures. And part of what we see through the novel is his fascination, but also growing revulsion with Hollywood as a dream factory. And, um, we also see him, you know, develop his talents slowly in the film. He gets work on this big budget production of the Battle of Waterloo. And he, he gets trusted by some of the higher ups because his art is good to do some of the production sketches for this. And so we see his, his, uh, his talents and his skills within the industry develop. In the film, he's living in the San Bernardino Arms, which is one of these kind of Hollywood bungalow complexes where several different people live in small apartments and small houses. And there lives Faye Greener with her father, Harry. Faye's Karen Black, Harry's Burgess Meredith. Harry is a washed up old vaudeville act. And he's in the film, I think, the one most representative of the way like Hollywood spits you out 
when it's done with you. Um, Faye is an inspiring starlet. Karen Black has this kind of 30s look. Her hair looks great. And the way she's lit and shot throughout the film by Conrad Hall gives her this sort of gauzy, old-timey look. And um, she's not good. <laughs> She's a bad actor. She's a very kind of shallow and superficial person. Todd falls in love with her or in lust with her in spite of this. And she tells him from the beginning, like, you're not going to make it with me because I need a rich man and, especially in the book, a good looking man. And you're not that, but you're nice, so let's be friends. And they go out to movies together and on dates, but there's often. Um, another man involved and I'll come to that in a moment. So part of the story is Todd trying to um, improve his lot at the studio. In the film it's at uh, Paramount Studios actually. Um, it's a fake or a, a fictionalized one in the book. Um, part of it is his pursuit of Faye and his constant frustration that she'll get close to him. In the film they actually get closer earlier and there are scenes of them kissing and holding hands and and she's much more flirtatious in, in a physical way. Um, but there's also this subplot in the film about Faye being a virgin and wanting to sort of save her or protect her virginity. Um, and that kind of comes crashing down about halfway through the film. And then there are all these side characters. So there's her father, there's Abe, um, the little person who's a sort of a bookie and a, a kind of a, an aggressive sort of uh, money grubbing <laughs> tough guy, I guess. And he, he's played great and he's a wisecracker and he's always talking about broads and dames and drinks and booze and this sort of stuff. And there's a lot of that. 30s flavor. Um, there's Earl who's a cowboy who wants to be a cowboy. He wants to be in cowboy movies but it's not in the film but he also has a job working as a cowboy in a sort of western themed shop. Um, there's Miguel, his friend, um, who is a Mexican who runs cockfights and this is a very important part of the film. And then there's Homer Simpson and did Matt Greening get the name for Homer Simpson from this? Probably, although he's told the story differently. He wrote a novel before he ever conceived of The Simpsons with a character named Homer Simpson. He knew this Homer Simpson. His father is named Homer though. Who knows? But anyway, this is the first Homer Simpson played by Donald Sutherland. And it's very interesting because you would think uh, in terms of their star quality at the time that, that Sutherland might have played Todd and Atherton Homer. But Sutherland does a fantastic job in this kind of very important secondary role. And Homer is an accountant from the Midwest who has um, kind of socialization problems. He's very shy, but he's also very anxious. He's a very kind and nice person. He's particularly shy and anxious around women. And we do get one scene in the film where he talks about how he may have or almost had sex with a, um, a showgirl back home in Indiana uh, that didn't go well. Something about it didn't go well. And the, the book goes into this more. And he had an anxiety attack. And so his doctor said, move to California. It's sunny. It'll be good for you. And he saved up quite a bit of money. So he doesn't work. He lives in his own house. And he comes into their lives because Harry, Faye's father, has been reduced to selling um, silver polish or a solvent in the film and he goes to Homer's house to try to sell him. He, he carries around his case and he has an attack, maybe a heart attack, some sort of health issue and Homer calls Faye. Faye comes over and through this Homer becomes part of this weird group of, you know, the Yaley, the, the wannabe starlet, the introverted uh, accountant, the the little fella who is aggressive and a bookie and is into the horses, uh, the cockfighter, and so on. And it's this sort of melange of weird marginal people, all of whom are living on the edge that make up the cast of characters in this film. And they all want something and very few of them get what they want in the film. And that's what builds the tension of frustration. And that's what the film is about in a way, this, how this tension 
can't be alleviated because Hollywood has promised glory, riches, fame. And for these people and many like them, it doesn't deliver. All of this is tied in with this idea of Hollywood as fake. Hollywood as a place of performance or performativity. Um, a lot of these characters can't not be the characters that they've decided they are. Uh, you get this little kid, Adore, who is being groomed by his mother to be a star or maybe a starlet. And he pops up throughout the film, but he's dressed and his hair is styled and his his affectation and manner seem to be modeled on someone like Shirley Temple. And he can't really break out of this role except when he does, he does it to be vicious and this will have consequences for the end of the film. But also, for example, Earl, who's always a cowboy now that he's decided that's what he's going to be, and Faye, who's always a starlet, um, and who's always seems to be performing, even when she's just at home or with her father or with Todd or whatever it might be. There's a great passage in the book where Todd's thinking about, uh, I haven't read it for a long time and I, I thought I had it here, but I don't, but where Todd's thinking about the different house styles in Los Angeles and how you can go down the street and you might have um, a sort of Mediterranean bungalow next to an, a Mexican adobe next to a Tudor mansion and that there's no, not uniformity, even unity. There's no sense of community or even a sort of eye to design. Each of these homes is in a way performing what its builder thought such a house would say about themselves, right? So I'm the kind of person who lives in an English Tudor estate. I'm the kind of person who lives in a Mediterranean bungalow and so on. And this is part of what Todd sees as the shallowness or the, the, the fakeness of Hollywood, even as he gets caught up in it. And the film does this a lot by showing us the fakeness of Hollywood production. So we get an opening scene where Todd moves into the San Bernardino arms and gets his first uh, side at Faye. And he also moves into this place where there's a crack in the wall and the landlady tells him, oh, we can't fix the crack. The crack's got a historical importance. So he puts a flower in the crack and that's kind of a metaphor for, you know, Hollywood. Um, and then we cut to this production scene where we get to see um, the fakeness of Hollywood. Sir Solomon's and Lady Ursula Ogo, the Countess of Hoosh Plu, Their Excellencies, Monsieur and Madame Chavary, Prince Carl and Princess Helena of Regensburg, the Baron and Baroness Dolbans of Luxembourg, Prince Imbrun Naruba of Zanzibar. Lord and Lady De Leon of Kittenden. John Jacob Lloyd, Rector of Jocks Bridge. Sir Sebastian. There's another great example of this much later in the film when we cut to uh, the first day of shooting or the first day that we see of shooting on the Napoleon Waterloo film. And the cut's done like this. Keep it rolling. 
I really love that because when we cut to the set, there's no indication that we've cut to the set, but there's something about it. You know, there's that matte painting backdrop. There's something artificial, but the film doesn't tell us this. So we cut from, there's a lot of on location shooting in the film around Los Angeles. So we cut from this location to another location, except of course it's revealed to be a set. And later in the scene, Right, the set starts to fall apart, which is a very minor subplot uh, and part of Todd's sort of coming to terms with Hollywood's fakeness. But just that collapsing set also shows us, you know, nothing here is real. This is embodied in a different way, but an important way in Harry. So Harry, as I said, is a former vaudevillian. He's older now, he's sick, he's taking care of his daughter, but she's kind of taking care of him. Um, there, there's a lot of anger and frustration in this relationship. He seems to feel like she's not doing enough for him. She seems to feel like he's holding her back. Um, but he's the one that's kind of still making regular money and he does this by selling um, this solvent, going door to door and selling it. But to sell it, he makes it part of his act. How do you do? I'd like to entertain you for a moment or two. I'll sing and I'll dance and I'll take a chance to sell a little bottle of magic to you. So even though he's no longer a vaudevillian, even though uh, his prospects have completely dried up, he keeps this performance going. And this is kind of in a way symbolic of how they all keep performance going to keep their spirits buoyed in the face of constant, regular, and probably likely continual failure. And these kind of failures come up in, in big ways and small ways throughout the film. For example, Faye invites Todd to go to a movie with her. It's a movie that she has a bit part in and maybe a speaking line. And she says kind of offhand, a friend of mine is going to be there. Well, when they get there, it's Earl. Todd's excited because he thinks, oh, I'm finally going on a date with Faye, but what he actually gets is... Uh, uh, you mean alley up? Inflation. And so his sort of sexual desires for her are frustrated and they are constantly frustrated throughout the film. But not only his desires, there's a scene when he goes with Esty and Esty's a little bit different in the film where he's more of a producer type than in the book where he's a screenwriter and a little bit closer to Todd's level, although still kind of um, his mentor into the seamy side of Hollywood. And they go to a sort of house of ill repute, but a classy one where um, the Madame, played by Natalie Schaefer, best known perhaps as Mrs. Howell on Gilligan's Island, and she shows blue movies there. And Todd goes with Claude and some others, and they're in this little screening room, and they're watching the blue movie, and they're commenting on it. And uh, the film burns and runs out, so they don't get to see the climax. So it's another example of desire linked to sexual desire being sort of truncated or cut off or unfulfilled. And this goes on uh, throughout the film. So as it develops, this tension builds and it's very slow. The first half of the film or the first, it's about a two hour film and the first sort of 45 minutes are quite slow. And they're meant to kind of indicate, I think, the boredom of life in Hollywood. I mean, we get a scene when once we've met Homer where he's just sitting in his garden and it goes and it goes. And we get these scenes where Todd and Faye go out and nothing happens. Or we get scenes with a door kind of dancing and being annoying, but nothing comes of it. And that boredom is important, I think, for the film because 
it creates the conditions for the characters out of which this frustration arises. They're not making headway in their careers and they want to fulfill their desires in another way. Those ways are getting frustrated as well and this creates a violent tension. One of my favorite scenes, <laughs> favorite's probably not the right word for this, one of the most intriguing, <laughs> one of the most intriguing scenes where we see this is the campfire scene. And this is a great scene in the book and in the film. Earl, the cowboy, is actually, you know, his, he's so sort of, let's say, unsuccessful that he's camping. He doesn't have a place to live and he camps out with this guy named Miguel, who I've mentioned, who's the Mexican, um, who has this sort of braggadocio and he's, he's, he's like the happiest guy in the movie actually. And he is a cockfighter and he has all of these, um, chickens that he breeds for cockfighting and they live together at this campsite and Faye invites Todd out to, for a night of drinking around the campfire. This is the first time we meet Miguel and it's just a fascinating scene because Faye is aware of her sexual allure and she likes it. In some ways, I think Faye is not to put, you know, not to sort of metaphorize her too much, but she's representative of Hollywood as unobtainable because she sets herself as unobtainable. You know, she's, she has, she does talk about her virginity and saving it. She tells Todd, you know, quite to his face, nothing's going to happen. And while she's kissing these men and flirting with these men, that's all they're going to get. And in a way, that's sort of how Hollywood success is throughout the film. But in this scene, she meets Miguel, they're drinking tequila and things get tense. Right? So Earl there is with his friend Miguel and they remain friends after this importantly. And he's happy with things. He's okay with things. They're drinking. And then it's too much for him because his sexual frustration around Faye, he knows it's not going to be fulfilled. He sees the sexual flirtation that's going on with Miguel and he reacts in violence. And this is a lot of what this film is about. Todd will also react in violence and I haven't shown it because it's, it's a brutal scene and you should know about this. But immediately after this, Todd attempts to rape Faye. He chases her into the woods and it comes as quite a shock in the film because so far Todd's been kind of whiny and bitchy about Faye sort of, you know, leading him on. But that's it. That's all he's exhibited in the book we get, we're, we're sort of privy to his sexual fantasies, which are violent. And so it's, it's less of a surprise that it happens. And it's more just a surprise that, damn, I didn't think he was going to go through with this. Um, 
And that colors their relationship for a time, of course, as it would, but also Faye because she's not getting the stardom that she wants, that she feels she deserves, comes to recognize that this kind of sexual attraction from men, even if it's a little bit violent, is maybe as close as she's going to get. And this will lead to her decision later to go work at the sort of classy um, house of ill repute after her father dies and her money stream dries up. So not only is everybody frustrated in their desires, they're also frustrated in their sort of ideals or their ethics, if they can be described as ethics. And Todd is the same. And this is one of the things I think that makes the film in a way a difficult watch is that nobody's really good in this movie. Even Homer, who seems to be just a kind of a nice, perhaps slightly disturbed, but a nice guy who wants to help Faye and who remains friends with Todd, even though he knows Todd is attracted to Faye. Um, even he is not a good person, right? And we see that at the end in a way that I won't spoil, but he also erupts in this really dramatic and brutal moment of violence. So what kind of film is this? Is like sleazy Hollywood or the seamy side of Hollywood uh, a genre in its own right? I don't know if we can say that. Um, there are certainly lots of films about uh, the aspiration for success and films where it is successful and films where it is a failure. Um, and they don't have to be in Hollywood. They can be in sports or in the music industry or even in, in business or, or whatever it might be. So it might be one of those kinds of films, an aspirational film. It might be, um, we might call it a historical drama, a depression era drama. There's a lot of ways to categorize this film, but I think also in ways that aren't, um, you couldn't market it as such. This is a horror film. And it's a horror film about mass psychosis. <laughs> and it's the mass psychosis that's brought on by the promise of not just success, but the promise of glamour, the promise of fame, the promise of we're in the money and the lie behind that. And the horror in the film builds slowly. And at first it doesn't come out as horror. It comes out as these kind of uncanny, uncomfortable scenes that I guess you could call cringy, but not in the way my, my son says, in the way that they're just uncomfortable to watch. So for example, when Harry gets sick and after he's had his attack at Homer's, Faye takes him to one of these churches where there's a faith healer. And as I said earlier, there's several of these in the book, but we get this one example here and we see an example of healing. And then they bring Harry up on stage and we get this scene. It's just so 
weird and uncomfortable and Burgess Meredith's performance there and the sweat on his face this to me is almost like a horror scene or or maybe not if it's or maybe it's not horror but maybe it's something almost kind of lynchian in the hyper real uncomfortableness of it so I don't know if you can call it a horror film necessarily, but these moments, these eruptions, these kind of Lynchian moments of sort of uncanny hyper-reality intensify the feeling of dread um, and intensify the feeling that underneath the surface, violence is bubbling. And this kind of comes to a head in the cockfight scene near the end of the film. And after Harry dies, Faye moves in with Homer. And Homer's a nice guy, but he lets her take advantage of him. And, you know, they have a business arrangement where basically he pays for everything and he buys her new clothes and he buys her food. And she scorns him and manipulates him. He's in love with her. Todd's still in love with her. Um, so she moves in with Homer and she manipulates him and takes advantage of him and she eventually convinces him to allow Earl and Miguel to move into his garage and they organize this cockfight and, and there are lots of kind of disruptions or hurdles to it um, at the last minute but the cockfight goes on in the garage and the way that it's filmed and edited is really fascinating so you get the preparations for the fight and there we have Todd and he brings Claude Claude's kind of slumming you know this is this movie executive he's like "Ooh, what's this all about um, and you have Miguel and Earl and Abe and Abe is as I've said this sort of cocksure um, bookie and gambler and he takes on the role of one of the sort of cockfighters with because of some of the disruptions I mentioned and as they're preparing for the cockfight we cut from that to Homer in the kitchen preparing this lavish spread of food we know he likes to cook to Faye in the bedroom getting ready and the way we cut back and forth between these sequences where the set piece is this violent cockfight is the slow but building crescendo leading towards violence. And we're going to get several violent disruptions by the end of this party. We have this party where after the cockfight and one of them dies and there's blood, and I don't know how they filmed this, you know, without violating a million animal rights laws, but um, where everybody's riled up with this bloodlust and they're drinking a lot and there's Faye and there's these six men all kind of vying for her and except for Homer who kind of disappears. Nobody even notices it's his house and he just kind of gets fed up and leaves. And there are gonna be several moments of violence here that foreshadow the end of the film. And the end of the film is going to erupt in a kind of paroxysm of mass hysteria driven violence, which is what the film has been leading to all along. And in a way, this violence kind of ties together the two sides of Todd. You have Todd, the East Coast liberal elite, um, although he's kind of in need of money throughout the film, but he's, he kind of looks down upon these denizens of Hollywood. You know, they're the people who've come here to die. And as he works on his mural of the burning of Los Angeles, these people get more and more twisted um, as he sees them as twisted people. But then there's Todd, like his physical person who's there in this eruption of violence at the end who has got just as caught up in this kind of dream factory slash city of broken dreams as everyone else and this is how the film is going to end and it, it, it creeps up on you it's a slow build and we start with this sort of there's Faye in the garden and she has this halo of light around her hair and Todd moves into his room and there's a crack in the wall but he puts a flower in it as if he can beautify Hollywood but no, you can't. You cannot beautify the crack. The crack is there and it's just gonna grow and more people are just gonna fall into it. And this is kind of what the film builds to and it does so in a way of, as I said, hysterical mass violence, bloodlust violence, 
which is kind of representative of the frustrations of the depression, kind of representative of the frustrations of Hollywood as a dream factory, kind of representative of each of the individual characters thwarted hopes and desires, and, and kind of representative, I think, if you want to extend your reading to like the frustration of the American dream or something like that, but <laughs> you write a paper about that. Um, and this is what the film comes to be about. And this is why I say it works in ways as a horror film. That's all for now, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. As I always say, if you're still here at this point in the video, you definitely got to throw down a like and a subscribe. And I ask my viewers to share this with your movie loving friends as well. Maybe there's something here for them. Um, I'm going to continue to talk about the scuzzy side of Hollywood for a few more videos, so stay tuned for the next one, which should be coming soon. But until then, my name's Aaron Hunter. Keep watching movies.